to gather his people into his tender heart. Ah. 
said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Yesterday we heard the beginning of Paul's sermon to the Jews in the synagogue when he went to uh, Antioch in the northern part of near Pisidia. And um, he is with Barnabas. James has gone, has gone home. Uh, Barnabas' cousin, uh, John rather, John Mark, has gone home. And so here he is, and he, he, yesterday what he did was, in his sermon, he, he outlined all of salvation history, the history of how God saved his people uh, from their slavery to Egypt, and then led them through the desert for many years, and then brought them to the promised land. And he ended his sermon with John the Baptist's coming and announcing uh, Jesus. So today, in the second part, he says... He tells them that, this is probably the most fascinating thing, brothers, you descendants of Abraham, so the Jews, and you others who fear God, so perhaps Gentiles who've come to believe, he says, to us, the message of this salvation has been sent. And then he says this, because the residents of Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus or understand the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they fulfill those words by condemning him. You know, it's interesting. He's not really hurling insult and blame at them. He's just simply saying, this is how it is. They failed to recognize him. And so, 
what Paul is telling them is that you have to be able to recognize who Jesus is, and they failed to recognize him. They considered him to be, to be just another. But Paul says God raised him from the dead, and so he is not just another, which really ties in really well with today's gospel reading, because it's the beginning of, well, it's chapter 14, the very beginning of chapter 14 of, of John. And in some ways, you might say that Jesus, though he was clearly Jewish, must have also been French as well, because this is the longest goodbye you've ever seen. It begins in chapter 14, and it goes straight through to chapter 17. It's the farewell discourse. It's quite long. But it begins this way. He tells the disciples not to be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Because, he says... In my Father's house there are many rooms, many dwelling places. And, and so it's a metaphor that he's using to sort of help them understand, you know the expression, a picture paints a thousand words. Well, he's painted a picture for us. So not, uh, you won't, when you, when you are with God, after you uh, go from this life to the next, you're not going to actually have a, a room, a physical room. But what God is saying is there is a, a permanent place that's been prepared for every one of us. And it's been prepared from the beginning of time. See, this was, as I said before, this has always been the plan. The plan was never that we should come and be condemned. I mean, Jesus makes it abundantly clear, I've come into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world. That's why he came. So it's to gather us back in, because we had gone astray, like sheep. And we were lost, and we were not coming back on our own. I mean, we, no matter how hard we tried, when you're, when you're lost, you're lost. Have you ever been lost? Have you ever been out in the woods and realized that you've turned around and you have no clue how to get back to where you're going? I remember that happening to me when I was young. I was in scouts, and, and uh, we'd gone off into the woods, and, and, we, and we got lost. We had no idea how to get back. And there's a sense of panic that rises, and, and you don't think clearly anymore, and you can't see your way back, and you can't even think your way back. Well, that's what... Jesus did. He came and he found us and brought us back. Because the plan was always that we would always have this place. The place that was prepared, a permanent place in God's heart for each and every one of us, that we would spend eternity with God. And that place was prepared, of course, because it's God's heart, not just some mansion, but it actually is God's heart. Because of that, it's been prepared from well before any of this took place, any of this wonderful creation even before you were born, a place was prepared for you. So that's the wonderfulness of this great mystery that's revealed to us through the resurrection. That's why we celebrate it for as long as we do, because this is astonishing news. Each of us has a place that's been prepared for us. And then Jesus says to the disciples, I'm going to prepare this place for you. I mean, I'm going to make sure that it's all set. Again, it's the metaphor. And he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, who is, you know, Thomas is always the one who, who speaks brashly, who speaks what everybody else is thinking, but is probably afraid to say. And he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And this is the famous line, right? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. So to say that he is the way really dovetails with, with what, what, what Paul is telling the, the Jews and the Gentiles at the synagogue. He's saying you failed to recognize him. You thought he was, maybe perhaps you thought he was a way. You know, just another guru, another flash in the pan. But he says, Jesus says, no, I'm not just a way. I am the way. And that's not meant to be sectarian or exclusive or anything like that. He's simply saying, I am the, the way. If you want to find your way, I am the way. In other words, look to me. I'm not just some other way of life. I'm not just some other person with a lot of good advice. I am the way. So look to me. Follow me. Believe in me. I am the way. Now, this is a very interesting thing because... You know, 
it really does push the point. I mean, it, it takes us completely out of our comfort zone. Because we, we can actually say that, oh yeah, I, I'm a believer, I, I follow Jesus. But we fall back into the comfort of the ways that we have, our ways. And so you really have to really realize that what Jesus is, he's drawing a line in the sand. There's one of two possibilities. Either he is the way, or he's a liar. He's not the way. Or something in between, perhaps? What is there in between? There is no place in between. He's saying, you have to follow me. You have to believe into me. You have to trust me. I am the way. I'm the truth. And that's not just to say that everything he says is the truth, but his whole way of living is the truth. I am the life. You want life. You want eternal life. Then follow the way. Follow me. And so he's inviting not just believers, not just you and me, not just Catholics, not just Christians, the entire world. He's saying to the world, this is the way. Come this way. Follow the way. So it's really, we, we, we probably have a temptation to, to make it more complicated than it really is. It's very simple. Either he is the way or he is not the way. So the onus is on us today as we hear this very familiar gospel, those of us who've been saying that we're Christians for a very long time, that we really actually need to not fall into the same pitfall that the leaders of Jerusalem fell into, which is to fail to recognize exactly who he is. He is the way. All of us are invited to re-examine the way we're living and the way we're acting and our own attitudes to see if we've become maybe complacent in such a way that we don't really recognize him anymore. Maybe we say that we do, but we really don't recognize him. So we're all called to take a look at ourselves, especially today with these readings, to say, okay, have I, have I sort of reshaped Jesus into something that's more comfortable for me? If that's the case, he's no longer the way, nor the truth, nor the life. He's something we made. And we know what happens with what we make. What we make turns to dust as quickly as we do, or even sooner. So the invitation is there. Jesus either is the way or he is not. Choose. And if he is the way, if he is the way, and of course we say that he is, then our way is clear. We are to follow him to the best of our abilities, which is to say that we are to conform our lives to the way, which means that we are to really take a hard look at what it is that Jesus was asking us to do and to redouble our efforts to do it. Is it easy? Of course, it's not easy. If it was easy, there would be no question. Is it easy to love your enemy? And that was the litmus test, by the way. It's easy to love your family because they'll love you back. But to love your enemy, that is to uh, take a chance, a very good chance, that you will not be loved in return. That's the test. Can you will the good of the other for their own sake and not expect anything back in return? That's what a follower of the way does. Why? Because that is what the way himself did. Can you make a preferential choice for those who are poor and weak and vulnerable rather than the more attractive option, which is to hang out with those who are powerful and rich and, and who can protect you? Well, they cannot protect you, ultimately, can they? In fact, if anything, you know full well there is no human being that can say to you, oh, I will love you unconditionally and you will never have to worry. Anybody can betray you, but not the way. The way is an absolute thing, an absolute person. And that's the big difference. We follow a person who is the way, not just an ideal or a philosophy which is a way. No matter how good that other way may seem, it is not the way. So today, an invitation to sit down and really look at the fundamentals, the basics of how we live our Christian lives, 
to see if we indeed are continuing to work at being disciples of Jesus. Will you make it in this life? Likely not. But the point of this life is not to achieve it now. It is to keep trying to achieve it, to work your way toward him. Make your way his way. Make, your way, make yourself like him. That's the whole point of it. So, an admonition today. Not to fail to recognize the way, but instead to more fervently adhere to the way, the truth, and the life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, the work of human hands, and become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine, work of human hands, and become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to be pleased with us in the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours will be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Accept in compassion, Lord, we pray, the offerings of your family, that under your protective care they may never lose what they have received, but attain the gifts that are eternal. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right. Oh. 
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of pain, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, spread throughout the world and bring it to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Albert, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters, who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and Glorious Martyrs, Saint Bernadette of Lourdes, Saint Boniface, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, that we too may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him with him, O God Almighty, Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever.
take away the sins of the world. Grant us your me by this, the most holy body of blood, from all my sins and every evil, keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me depart from you. Behold the Lamb of God, the way, the truth, the life, who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. prayer of communion by desire. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And in that spirit, having been transformed by the presence, the Eucharistic presence, the sacramental presence of Jesus in your hearts, truly present, truly transforming us and conforming us to the way, the truth, and the life, I invite you now to take a moment to offer your thanksgiving and also to include in your minds someone that you find difficult to love. Take a moment now and simply ask God, from the goodness of your heart, to the goodness, the great goodness of God's heart, to give that person, to will that person's good, that they may have all good, that they may have eternal life, that they may come to know the way, the truth, and the life, and accept that into their hearts, and expect nothing in return. Regina Cheni, le care, alleluia, qui aque meruisti portare, alleluia, resurrexit, sicur dixit, alleluia, ora pro nobis Deum. Queen of heaven, be joyful. 
Save, O oh Lord, we pray, those whom you have saved by your kindness, that redeemed by the passion of your Son, they may rejoice in his resurrection. He who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go forth in peace, the Mass has ended. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.